I'm truly honored to be here tonight to be a part of this lectureship, to have the great association of so many wonderful and outstanding gospel preachers, and to have the fellowship of so many of you good brethren. A few years ago, a book was published by Hal Lindsey, that is authored by him, entitled The Late Great Planet Earth, and it is a book that has virtually revolutionized the thinking of many people in the religious world. It is, in fact, a religious phenomenon. The copy that I have, which I purchased a number of years ago, had already at that time sold more than two and a half million copies. Since that time, it's been multiplied a number of times. You see it everywhere, in drugstores, in supermarkets, in bus stations. And it has created a dispensational mania, a keen interest in eschatology, the Bible doctrine concerning final things. And perhaps one of the most sensational aspects of the whole dispensational scheme is the Battle of Armageddon. Now, a lot of people have been virtually frightened out of their wits by the concept of an impending, awesome Battle of Armageddon. It is alleged by Hal Lindsey and others of his kind that we are on the threshold of one of the most catastrophic, devastating, bloody holocausts that the human race has ever known. Moreover, that this tremendous and devastating Battle of Armageddon is right on the horizon. Hal Lindsey, for example, teaches that the Battle of Armageddon is preceded by the so-called seven-year tribulation period. He further maintains that the seven-year tribulation period is just on the horizon as evidenced by the signs given in Matthew chapter 24. As a matter of fact, he has a little cliche in which he says that Matthew 24 is knocking at the door. Lindsay maintains that the generation which witnessed the establishment of Israel as an independent state will be the generation which witnesses the tribulation which is culminated by the Battle of Armageddon. And since he says that with the establishment of Israel as an independent state in 1948 by David Ben-Gurion, and since he further says that a generation is approximately 40 years, his timetable is that uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of between now and 1988, the tribulation period will commence to be pinnacled by the Battle of Armageddon. As a matter of fact, I was in a bookstore just the other day, and I noticed on the latest edition of Lindsay's Late Great Planet Earth, on the back cover, there was this little statement. If you have plans for 1985, read this book first. And so people have been terrified by this catastrophic event that allegedly looms on our political horizon. We're going to talk about the Battle of Armageddon tonight uh, as per Hal Lindsey and then examine what the Word of God says about the subject. First of all, however, I think it would be wise if we would make a couple of brief observations uh, with reference to definitions. I want to make a distinction between premillennialism and uh, dispensationalism. All dispensationalists are premillennialists, but not all premillennialists are dispensationalists. The word premillennial is derived of two roots, pre, meaning before, and millennium, having to do with a period of 1,000 years. Hence, premillennialism actually suggests the idea that Christ will return pre, or before, he commences an earthly reign of 1,000 years. Dispensationalism is more radical even than the heretical premillennialism, in that it suggests the idea that as God created the world in six days and upon the seventh day he rested, even so the whole history of the human race is divided into seven dispensations or spans of time, the last of which will be the millennium or the earthly reign of Christ on David's throne from the city of Jerusalem. As I've already suggested, the current concept is that we're now living in the final days, the final years, perhaps the final decade of the seventh, or rather the sixth dispensation of this so-called dispensational scheme. 
Now, in order to appreciate what we're going to say tonight about the Battle of Armageddon, you have to understand where it fits in to the general dispensational concept. And so I'd like to sketch out for you very briefly the major events that are supposed to characterize the dispensational theology. First, it is alleged that Christ came to the earth a little more than 19 centuries ago for the purpose of establishing his kingdom. But since he was surprisingly rejected by the Jews, he did not, in fact, establish the kingdom, but as an afterthought, set up the church in its place. He then returned to heaven, and now, according to Matthew chapter 25, the bridegroom is tarrying. But according to the signs indicated in Matthew chapter 24, there is good reason to believe that the Lord is now about to come again. But when he comes, he is going to come in a silent, invisible fashion. And when he comes, two things basically will occur. Number one, he will rapture or mysteriously, miraculously catch up all living saints and also resurrect from the dead all of the righteous dead. That uh, phenomenon is referred to by Lindsay and others as the rapture. And then the rapture is supposed to commence the seven-year tribulation period, which is alleged to be the 70th of Daniel's 70 weeks. The tribulation period is supposed to be divided equally into two sections of three and a half years. The first three and a half years will be a period of peace and relative prosperity, during which time Solomon's temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem, it's claimed, and Old Testament sacrifices will be offered once again, and the law will reign supreme with all of its former glory. And then the latter three and a half year period of the tribulation era is supposed to be characterized by persecution and uh, considerable conflict, bloodshed. And this final three and a half year period will then be culminated by the Battle of Armageddon, and Christ will then appear at the consummation of the Battle of Armageddon to wind it up and to effect complete victory, and then sit down on David's throne in Jerusalem and literally reign for 1,000 years, after which time commences then the judgment and eternity. Now, I'd like to look at that very briefly and then place a major emphasis upon the Battle of Armageddon per se. First of all, the idea that suggests that Jesus came to the earth for the purpose of setting up his kingdom but did not, in fact, set it up is contrary to the word of God in a whole host of ways. In the first place, the Bible plainly affirms that the kingdom of Christ was set up on the day of Pentecost and that it is the same as the organism that the New Testament refers to as the church. In Colossians 1.13, Paul, speaking in the past tense, said that we've been translated into the kingdom. The Apostle John, writing to the seven churches of Asia, said in Revelation 1.9, I, John, your brother, and partaker with you in the tribulation and kingdom and patience, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Jesus said in his nighttime conversation with Nicodemus, except a man is born anew, he shall in no wise see the kingdom. And then in John 3, 5, he said, except one is born of water and the spirit, he shall in no wise enter the kingdom. The Lord, therefore, in that passage suggested that submission to the terms of the new birth would induct one into the kingdom. If I did not believe that it was possible for an individual to enter the kingdom today, I would not claim to preach the new birth. Billy Graham, for example, travels all over the world claiming to preach the new birth, and yet he suggests the kingdom has not as yet been established. Not only is that so, but the Lord said in Luke chapter 22 that he had appointed a table that the disciples might eat and drink at that table in the kingdom. If the kingdom is not here, then people have no right to be partaking of the Lord's table. And yet in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul indicated that the Corinthians were partaking of the table of the Lord. The only thing about it was they couldn't partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons at the same time. So it's obvious that the Corinthian brethren were in the church or in the kingdom, and thus it was already in existence in the first century. In the second place, the idea that Christ was surprisingly rejected by the Jews and consequently had to postpone the kingdom plans, smacks of infidelity from beginning to end. It reflects upon the foreknowledge of God. And the Old Testament is absolutely filled with passages which indicate that the Jews would in fact reject Christ. 
not the least of which is Psalm 118, 22. The stone which the builders rejected, the same was made the head of the corner. So the rejection of Christ by the Jews was certainly no surprise to the omniscient, all-knowing, foreknowing God Almighty. In the third place, the idea that the church was set up as an afterthought is erroneous because, as was eloquently pointed out last night, the church, according to Ephesians 3.10, was the vehicle for the making known in heavenly places of God's manifold wisdom according, now watch it, to the eternal purpose, that is, plan, which God purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, sometimes we're real careless about the way we use the word church. The church, according to New Testament doctrine, is simply the body of saved people. Sometimes people say, do I have to be in the church to be saved? That's like saying, do I have to be in the saved to be saved? Certainly you have to be in the saved to be saved. Now I'm saying that to emphasize this point. If the church was an accidental feature of the plan of God, then salvation is accidental. God never did intend to save anybody anyway, but accidentally did by the establishment of the church. Now again, I, I suggest that that has some real serious consequences that reflect upon God and upon Christ our Lord. In the third place, Matthew chapter 24 does not give, as Brother Deaver very well pointed out this morning, signs concerning the second coming of Christ. And that ought to be obvious to anybody who carefully examines the text. Jesus gave signs concerning the coming of an event. It obviously was not his second coming because Matthew 24, 36 said that he did not know the time of his second coming. I never cease to be amazed that men like Hal Lindsey believe they can read Matthew 24 and know when the Lord's coming and the Lord who gave Matthew 24 didn't know when he was coming at the time he gave it. And that would seem to me by implication to exalt the wisdom of Lindsay above that of the Lord. Moreover, Lindsay contends that this tribulation period which is foretold by the signs in Matthew 24 will be characterized by a nuclear warfare which will culminate in the Armageddon conflict. Brother Deaver was pointing out this morning how the signs in Matthew 24 were temporary and local, such things as uh, pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath. And the Lord also said that let those who are upon the rooftop not come down. Let me tell you something. If the tribulation time comes and it involves nuclear warfare, the last place I want to be is up on top of the house. I want to be under it, not on top of it. And that's another one of the indications that uh, Matthew chapter 24 was not talking about the final coming of Christ, but rather was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which was accomplished in 70 A.D. Then, as I suggested a moment ago, the premillennial concept suggests that Christ is going to come silently and invisibly to rapture the saints. The Bible is very clear upon the fact that when Christ comes, it will not be silently. Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When the Lord will descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Shout, voice, trump. And 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 says, concerning that very same day, the day of the Lord, as it's identified in the early part of that chapter, that the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements shall be dissolved. So Christ is not going to come silently, nor is he going to come invisibly. The last verse of Hebrews chapter 9 says that when Jesus comes the second time, he will appear. He will appear the second time. Now the first time he came, in his incarnate form, he came in an appearance fashion. The inspired writer of Hebrews says when he comes the second time, he will come in an appearance. And that settles the matter, as well as many other passages which could be introduced. And then the doctrine alleges that that rapture of the living saints and resurrection of the righteous dead, and it's already been pointed out that the Bible is very clear with reference to the matter that both the righteous and the unrighteous will be resurrected at the same time. John 5, 28 and 29. And further, Paul said in Acts 24, 15, there shall be a resurrection, singular, 
of both the just and unjust. Two classes, one resurrection. Well, they maintain that the rapture is going to commence then the tribulation period. Now, let me pause here to show you another serious implication of this doctrine. The idea that in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, the Mosaic law is once again going to become operative. The temple will be rebuilt. It's, uh, to me, uncommonly strange that the Lord, in Matthew chapter 24, in showing that the temple was going to be destroyed and not one stone left upon another, did not allude to the fact that someday it would be eventually rebuilt. There's absolutely no indication of that, rather to the contrary. But the temple is going to be rebuilt, and the law of Moses will become operative again. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot, for the life of me, understand how anybody who had ever spent 15 minutes in the book of Hebrews could ever come up with the idea that the law of Moses, those old bloody animal sacrifices which never could take away sins on a permanent basis, is somehow or another going to be resurrected. While that vitiates, attacks, negates, makes nugatory the finality of the atoning work of Christ at the cross. And it contains some serious and infidelic implications. Then the last three and a half year period of the tribulation to be climaxed by the Battle of Armageddon. Now let me give you Al Hal Lindsay's view of Armageddon from the political viewpoint. I've already suggested that he believes that it's right around the corner. As a matter of fact, every time somebody sneezes in the Middle East, these fellows think that the end is tomorrow. But Hal Lindsay says that there is right now building up a pressure force in the Middle East, which is going to culminate in Armageddon. Here's his scheme. Number one, there is presently building up a confederation of African-Egyptian forces that under the leadership of Egypt will, within the next few years, invade Palestine. When this confederation of African-Egyptian forces or Arab forces invades Palestine, that will precipitate the attack by Russia and the invasion of Palestine by Russia. And Russia will be able to vanquish, to defeat the Arab Egyptian forces and will in fact set up headquarters in Palestine. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, meanwhile over in Europe, Lindsay alleges that there is now building up a confederation of ten European nations. As a matter of fact, he believes that the European common market is the nucleus of this force. He believes that these ten European nations are actually prophesied back in Daniel chapter 2, where Daniel saw the great metallic image that had ten toes. And those ten toes are alleged to represent that ten-nation confederation. Now, this ten-nation confederation will be ruled over by some super dictator, an Adolf Hitler type, a Fuhrer, and uh, it's alleged that he's already born, he is a Jew, and he is existing somewhere in the world right now. Some of the more radical dispensationalists a couple of years ago suggested that Henry Kissinger might be the one. I'm sure he appreciates that. But anyway, this Jew, this Fuhrer, whom they declare is alluded to in the Word of God as the Antichrist. The Antichrist is marshalling this confederation of ten European nations. And these nations will then come in battle against Russia in Palestine. But before that, the Red Chinese will rise up with a horrendous war machine of some 200 million soldiers strong. And the Red Chinese will sweep down into Palestine and oust the Russians. And this, therefore, will set the final conflict for the Battle of Armageddon, which will occur between Red China and this confederation of European forces under the Antichrist. Now, all of this huge, catastrophic battle is supposed to take place on the plain of Megiddo as the center focus point. And oh, it'll be a horrible, bloody spectacle. Lindsay says 
that the blood will flow to the depth of a horse's bridle for 200 miles north and 200 miles south of Jerusalem. And then it'll gradually spread out, and the conflict will engulf all the major cities of the world, London and New York and Chicago and Paris, and all of them will be destroyed. As a matter of fact, he contends that the human race would virtually annihilate itself if it were not for the fact that right when the human race is on the brink of destru destruction, Christ will appear and win the battle of Armageddon for his people who have survived and set up his throne and begin his millennial reign from Jerusalem. Now that's Al Lindsay's theory in a nutshell. I May mean, I say that's where it ought to be, <laughs> in a nutshell. There's nothing like it in the Bible. We need to look at it very carefully. The only place that Armageddon is mentioned at all in the Bible is in the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation, verse 16. Preliminary to briefly discussing the passage, we need to make a couple of passing observations about the book of Revelation generally. Brother West has done a superb job. But let me, if I may, make a couple of brief comments for the benefit of those who have not been here in the daytime sessions. We need to understand a couple of facts about the book of Revelation. Number one, the purpose for which it was written, namely to console persecuted Christians in a time that must have been very bleak and very dark for those who espoused the cause of God. The book of Revelation was written during a time when the cause of Christ was being viciously persecuted by the Roman Empire. And it must have appeared to many of those first century saints from the natural viewpoint that the cause of their Lord Jesus Christ was going to go down the drain. And hence the book of Revelation was written as a book of comfort, a book of challenge, a book of hope, showing that regardless of how things may externally appear, God's cause will always triumph. God's cause will overcome all of its hostile enemies. As a matter of fact, I think I'd be safe in saying that the key word of the book of Revelation is the word overcome. The Greek word for overcome is nikao, and it's found 28 times in the New Testament. And of these 28 times, 17 of them are in the book of Revelation. That shows you the emphasis placed upon the word in the book. As a matter of fact, every one of the seven letters to the seven churches is concluded by an overcome passage. If you overcome, certain promises will be granted to you. I like the way I heard Brother Johnny Ramsey say it one time when he said the theme of the book of Revelation is this. If you overcome, you can come over. And that's really the gist of the book. And so that's the message of the book. It's a book of hope, a book of comfort, a book of promise of ultimate victory. In the second place, it needs to be recognized that the book of Revelation is a highly figurative or symbolic book. This is not only obvious from a cursory examination of the chapters themselves from 6 onward, but also, such as indicated by the very introduction of the book, chapter 1, verse 1, where the record says that the message was signified, signified, signified by the Lord through the angel to his servant John. So the book is a symbolic book. Now, symbolic biblical books, sometimes called apocalyptic books, employ figurative or symbolic language for two reasons. The first of which is that the symbols or the pictures highly dramatize, highly, may I say, italicize, make very graphic and dramatic the pictures or the ideas to be conveyed. In the second place, symbolic or apocalyptic language is frequently employed as a sort of a code language to, shall we say, smuggle a message to the people of God that their enemies don't need to know. The Lord uh, taught in parables frequently from this design, Matthew chapter 13. He taught truths in parables. He could take the disciples aside and then subsequently explain the meaning of the parables to them. Those who would abuse those truths if they had access to them were thus concealed from the message. And so books like the book of Revelation and parts of Daniel and Ezekiel were written during times when God's people were under great stress and a message of hope was smuggled to them through the imagery or the symbolism of the book. Now, the fact of the matter is, uh, the book of Revelation and the symbols that are employed therein is largely based upon the language of the Old Testament. 
Westcott and Hort in their Greek text suggest that there are some 500 quotations, citations, or allusions in some degree or another in the book of Revelation from the Old Testament. Now, the point about that is simply this. The Christians, being familiar with their Old Testament scriptures, would be able to understand the symbols involved. The pagans, not being familiar with those inspired writings, would not be able to see the design of the message. The design being that the cause of Christ would triumph over its enemies. And so with that brief background regarding the nature of the language, may I suggest that any interpretation of the book of Revelation which does not recognize the symbolic nature of the language is absolutely destined to fail. And so it is with the passage having to do with Armageddon in Revelation 16, 16. May I please read from Revelation 16, beginning in the 13th verse. If you have your Bibles, you may want to read along with me. Reading from the American Standard Version. John says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits, as it were frogs. Well, they have the spirits of demons, working signs, which go forth unto the kings of the whole world, to gather them together under the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see a shame. They gathered them together into the place which is called in Hebrew, Armageddon, or as in the footnote of the American Standard Version, Armageddon. Now let's look at that very carefully. It, it seems to me that even the most superficial Bible student ought to be able to see that there's some highly figurative language involved here. In the first place, John says he sees coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits, as it were, frogs. We see here the forces that are going to be involved in the conflict of Armageddon. And John says they're unclean spirits, as it were, frogs. Are we to assume that this passage is literal and therefore that the Armageddon conflict will literally involve literal frogs that literally come out of the literal mouths of literal beasts and literal dragons to literally be involved in a literal conflict on the literal plain of Megiddo in literal Palestine. That almost gets you literally mixed up, doesn't it? I would assume that not even Hal Lindsey believes that the 200 million strong red Chinese force is going to be led by three literal frogs. I like to say I think the theory kind of croaks right there. <laughs> Notice, if you will, the 16th verse says that they're gathered together in a place which is called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Now, there's been some discussion among Bible scholars as to what the phrase here means, but based upon the study I've done, I think it's the most common interpretation that it here is, in fact, an allusion to the plain of Megiddo which was a hill some 70 feet high or adjacent to and therefore is based upon that place. But the place stands as a figure for something. Now listen, if we're going to get literal about this, the plain of Megiddo is a very small little plain, 14 miles by 9 miles approximately. If you bring a force of 200 million Chinese and assume that you've got a comparable force on the other side, let's say of 200 million, and you put 400 million soldiers on that little plane of 14 miles by 9 miles, nobody's blood could run anywhere because there wouldn't be enough room to get the sword out of your sheath. They might all smother to death, but nobody's going to stab anybody. So the very logistics of the situation argues against a literal interpretation. Now let me make this observation. Sometimes places, geographical locations, become figures for ideas in biblical literature. Let me give you one outstanding example. To the southwest of the city of Jerusalem was a valley known as the Valley of Hinnom. It was very famous in Old Testament times, principally because it was the place where the pagans, who were the neighbors of the Israelites, sacrificed their children to false gods. And the Israelites, back in those days, when they became enmeshed in those false and idolatrous practices, sacrificed their own 
children to those false gods. And hence, in the valley of Hinnom, it, there was a circumstance in which there was uh, weeping and suffering. And hence the word, the place, Hinnom, became a synonym for weeping and suffering. Because of those associations, in later times, that valley outside the city of Jerusalem became the city dump. And carcasses and refuse and junk was taken out there and burned. And it was continuously on fire. So the Jews put together those ideas of weeping and suffering and that of continuous burning. And from it coined the word Gehenna, which New Testament writers use for the final punishment of hell. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Fear not him that's able to destroy the body but cannot destroy the soul, but fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. But that certainly doesn't mean that on the judgment day people are going to be taken outside Jerusalem and thrown into a valley out there. That would be literalizing a spiritual concept which was in fact taken from a literal place. But the idea, you see, changed in the transition from the literal to the spiritual idea being conveyed. The book of Revelation contains the names of a number of places that stand for spiritual ideas. Zion and Jerusalem spiritually stand for the people of God. Babylon spiritually stands for apostasy and captivity. Egypt stands for bondage. Gomorrah, or Sodom rather, stands for wickedness. And various other symbols of that nature. And so it is with Armageddon. J.L. Hubbard in his Bible Atlas says that the plain of Megiddo is the most famous battlefield that the world has ever known. As a matter of fact, one of the crucial battles of the Old Testament was fought on it. When the forces of Deborah and Barak came in conflict with the forces of the pagan king Sisera, or Captain Sisera, where the record says that Sisera had 900 chariots of iron, but scarcely Anywhere among the 40,000 of Israel was there even a sword or a spear. And yet God's people overcame those seemingly insurmountable odds. Armageddon seems to stand, therefore, and Leon Morris in his very fine commentary on the book of Revelation says that probably the Armageddon concept in Revelation 16, 16 is borrowed from principally that event in the book of Judges. When God's people, a small and apparently insignificant force, were able to overcome a, from the human viewpoint, superior force. And thus victory was effected on the part of God's people. Certainly it would fit the picture of the general purpose of the book of Revelation. Armageddon, therefore, seems to be a symbol of the fact that God's people, though small, though persecuted, though downtrodden, though apparently in the minority, would, through the leadership of Christ, overcome those forces and ultimately be victorious. However, note this. There is nothing said in this context about the actual battle of Armageddon being fought. Turn with me very briefly to the book of Revelation chapter 19. and Let's read where the actual conflict takes place, and I think the thrust of it will be rather evident. In Revelation 19, 11, beginning, the Bible says this, And I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, White being the symbol here of victory. And he that sat thereon called faithful and true. Verse 13 says he was the word of God. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. We're talking then here about Christ. John is permitted to view into heaven, and he sees Christ riding upon a white horse. Notice, if you will, further. He that sat there on his call faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Underline the word war. Underline the word judge. Christ is coming to make war. That's Armageddon. Christ is coming to judge. Christ is coming to vanquish all those who have lived in rebellion to the holy God of heaven and his Son. Now read further. In the 13th verse, the record says, And he is arrayed in a garment sprinkled with blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses. Again, indicative either of their victory, likely there, and then in the latter clause of the passage, their purity. Followed in fine linen, 
white and pure. And then, if you will, note the 15th verse. And out of his mouth proceeded a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now, in the margin of your Bible, right beside that passage, you need to make this note, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. Because in 2 Thessalonians, in discussing the coming, the parousia of Christ, Paul says that when the Lord comes, he will slay his enemies with the breath of his mouth and bring them to naught, to nothing, by the manifestation of his coming. Now, in the scene described here in Revelation chapter 19, in which the Lord comes victoriously on his white horse, followed by his people on their white horses, he makes war, he slays his enemies with the breath of his mouth. When will he do that? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, when he comes, the second coming, the final coming. When will the war, therefore, of Armageddon occur? Not literally in Palestine, perhaps within the next few years, in a carnal, bloody conflict. But whenever, whether tonight or next year or a thousand years from now, whenever Christ comes to execute justice and to render vengeance upon those who've lived in opposition to him. Note, if you will, further. In the 15th verse, And out of his mouth proceeded a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God the Almighty. And he hath on his garment and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And I'll close tonight with this question. Who will the Lord fight against in the battle of Armageddon? Those upon whom he comes to render judgment. Well, who will they be? Those who have never named his name, who've never submitted to the gospel, and those within the body of Christ who've been unfaithful to their calling. Will the battle of Armageddon occur? Yes. Will it be literal? No. Will it be spiritual? Yes. Will there be people on the losing side? Yes. Let me tell you this. When Armageddon comes, it'll be far worse than any literal battle could ever be. You talk about being scared at some catastrophic holocaust to come of a literal nature. That's nothing compared to the vengeance that our God will render upon those who have hard-heartedly resisted his word and his saving grace. May we be on the winning side of Armageddon. God bless you all.